Cool. Bart, appreciate you coming in, man. Thank you for having me. So uh, I know a little bit about you, but maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into environmental history. Because prior to hearing you, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you that's a real thing. And I didn't know it was a real thing when I went to, to school. Um, you know, I'll do the slightly longer version. Sure, go ahead. Because uh, I, I, I haven't taught too much about it, but I'm starting to talk about it more. You know, when I grew up, I was dyslexic. It's, and I want to start there because I've, I've really felt like it's important to talk about that for people that are dealing with things. Mm -hmm. You don't think that somebody that's dyslexic should write a book. Let alone three. Let alone three. And, you know, maybe that tells you a little bit more about, like, I was all, I, we were talking about soccer. I played basketball. So there was also kind of a competitive side. Whatever your weakest link is, like, let's just go full bore at it and see if we can get good at it. Um, I grew up in Atlanta. And, and, you know, honestly, I think the origin, and I've realized this over time, for what I do started there because it was teachers that took an interest in taking a kid who was really struggling and said, okay, we were talking about kind of algorithms and formulas that make, you know, commerce work. Well, these teachers really figured out how to get my brain to kind of work. Mm -hmm. And so I think first and foremost, and again, this is kind of a new biography that I'm re kind of realizing now in my forties is that I wanted to be a teacher, you know, I really wanted to be, um, there for younger people that were going along on their journey and though I write books and you know I, um, I do a lot of research I think first and foremost I'm kind of a teacher um, I went to grad school after teaching high school in Garden City Georgia which is just outside of Savannah and it was like a really rough school and a really rough experience and I mm. thought man what's wrong with this system and Wanted to write about that. Ended up at grad school. Uh, as you said, um, I didn't know environmental history. I didn't know it either. What uh, did you study undergrad? In undergrad, I, I was all over the place. There was a student in my office hours today, because I teach here at Ohio State here in OHIO. And uh, they, <laughs> it was funny, because I could just see my like, former self in this kid, because he was just like, I really don't know what I want to do. And I'm, un I said, what's your major? And most students say accounting, you know, <laughs> they just go straight in. And he's like, I'm undecided. And I was like, awesome. Yeah. And so I did that. I took biochem to start, which is reflected in the work. I love the science. Mm -hmm. I took economics. I took um, computers and music with the with a professor who did the um, sound effects for the Matrix, Whoa. and I, I did a little DJing in my time. I, the headphones feel natural. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's like a yeah, it kind of brings me back. So all those things, and kind of was really just kind of searching for knowledge in all different areas. Chinese animation and film, I think, was a class I took. That's obscure. Very obscure, and it was all fun, you know. And I and I'm so happy that I went to school that really supported that, and so. But, you know, and I was kind of journeying. I tried to paddle by myself to the Gulf Coast after school from Atlanta, didn't make it. And, you know, tried to bike across country, didn't make it. <laughs> Dang, okay. In fact, when I got to grad school, there's a very famous Civil War historian named Gary Gatler. He said, he said, I think you have completion issues, Bart. And it was like this moment where I was like, maybe I do. And he's like, is that going to be a problem with you getting your PhD? <laughs> At the time, I remember being like, I'm never going to get my PhD. Oh, but long story short, you know, I was a wandering kid uh, who had formerly been dyslexic, but who had really cared about teaching, went to grad school, found this field of environmental history after thinking I was going to write about public schools and the problems of, in the mm. American South, and then just went all in and just was like this field that combines environmental science with history. It felt like just like such a perfect fit because I always cared about the planet mm -hmm. um, and I loved history and after that, it was kind of like, this is what I was born to do. Yeah, and it sounds like you, growing up in the South, had an enormous impact on that because there's a lot of really unique history in the South, both about uh, the economy and the companies and then how it infected, affected the environment. And misunderstandings about where you're from. I think I've always appreciated that, people that are trying to say, hey, here I am. You know, I'm not what you think I am, you know? Maybe that's part of that dyslexic history, too. It's one of the reasons I love Ohio. Yeah, I, I, got, I got called, I remember in my office the first couple of years here on Central Time. <laughs> All the time in Columbus, and I'd say, guys, we're not on Central Time. But just kind of being like, do you know where we are? Yeah, you know, right. that kind of feeling. I had that kind of kinship in a way because you go into school very far away from where I was from. I think people kind of 
didn't know where I was from. I was both proud of where I was from. I also saw the problems of mm-hmm. where I was from. I wasn't trying to just be like, the South is awesome. It's like, the South is just not what you think it is. Yeah. So I think it all connected there. And yes, the first book I wrote was on the history of Coca-Cola and its environmental impact around the world. And that led me to the history of Monsanto, which was actually Coke's caffeine supplier. Mm -hmm. Wrote a book on that. And then this book was kind of like me coming home in a way, writing about all these different companies from the American South. Yeah, so you write about five companies here. Um, How did you pick those companies? And maybe just give us a little snippet on on those. I mean, obviously, Coca-Cola, it sounds like you've got... Uh, I think you said in one of your other interviews, an obsession, sort of like, Coke goes, why are you so obsessed with me? You know? Exactly. Uh, so Coke, it made sense for them to be in there, which I think their history is really fascinating. I want to hear about it from you. Uh, but the other companies, how did those arrive at the companies that you ended up kind of using in your story? Yeah, I had a broad leash in writing this book, Country Capitalism, and, and uh Basically, the origin of was that the University of North Carolina Press came to me and said, we want you to just go do what you mm. want to do. Oh, that's and, good. Which was awesome. <laughs> yeah, great. You know, you get to a certain point in your life. And by that point, you know, it was actually a pretty grind to get through grad school. And like, so to have this opportunity to kind of do whatever you wanted to do. And so for me, by that point, I'd studied the history of economics in the South. And I thought, we're missing all these different businesses in the story. Mm-hmm. It's a lot about cotton, tobacco, agriculture, which is all true. And Tyson and other companies, which are, you mm. know, I think these books are great. We should read them. Um, but I didn't see some of these firms. I thought aviation was an area where we could do a lot more. Delta ends up in this book. I thought logistics, FedEx mm-hmm. in Memphis. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in these areas. You know, we were talking about Nashville, you know, being in Atlanta, I could get up to Tennessee. I got to see all these places. So to me, this was natural. And it was also driven by my experience being outside the South and people being like, well, the South's kind of a backwater, you know, in that economy and being like, what? Mm -hmm. Not from my perspective growing up in the 1980s and 90s. And so all these companies were feeling, I think, having studied the history of the American South and its economy, they just weren't in the textbooks. They weren't yeah. in the story. And I picked them, not because they were small firms. All of them were big leaders in their kind of, in, in each of their spaces. In the case of Walmart, which also ends up in the story, the largest corporation in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't do some of the things like KFC because I thought that had been written about, kind of the ag story and things like that. Good story, though. It's a great story. Yeah. In fact, still think there's some connections to all this through the book. And then um, I found a way to work in Exxon in the oil story because I think Houston needed its own story. But again, that had kind of been written about. Mm-hmm. So for me, this was like trying to put the South in the middle of this conversation about logistics, about finance, Bank of America's in the story, yeah. and in some ways moving people as well, aviation. Um, this kind of swift fly by night, as I say, kind of economy that we live in today that you're, you're very much a part of, right? Certainly. Um, how did this come about and what, what role did the American South play in it? That's kind of how it all came together. And weirdly, when I started looking at these individual companies, I started seeing connections that I didn't intend to see, mm-hmm. like Delta helping to develop the hub and spoke model that FedEx would build on and so forth and so on. So, um, it was an interesting journey. And I think, uh, getting inside the companies in ways that when I was younger, I didn't have maybe the nerve Mm -hmm. to, to to get to some of the interviews that are featured in the book. Um, it it felt like a fun project. I'll say one last thing. I wrote it at the same time as I was writing this book on Monsanto. Okay. So I wrote them simultaneously and I would suggest it whether you're dyslexic or not. (laughs) It's a bad strategy (laughs) if you're going to keep your sanity. Uh, A completion problem. You start two books, don't end up finishing either, right? Yeah, and I guess at that point, I just was like, screw it, we're going to get it done. Um, And so uh, this is a smaller book in a way, but honestly, um, really happy how it kind of came out because of, I I think these companies speak to one another. Yeah, kind of what I thought was interesting, what the fir- my first impression of these companies and what they had in common was that in a way, <clears throat> they flourished because they started in a place and in an area where it was difficult to service customers, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the Walmart 
model essentially. Absolutely. Instead of like just going to Atlanta, they went to smaller cities, right? And they were like, we're going to service these smaller rural towns. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Coca-Cola. You could certainly talk to this. They wanted to be in all of these small little gas stations sort of as uh, people are moving to automobiles. They're like, well, there's 1.5 million gas stations in the United States, so let's see if we can get into every single one of them. And that thought process of let's go out instead of just staying where we are sort of led to them being successful. Does that strike yeah, you as a commonality? I think so. And honestly, that, you know, if you do good history, you know, thinking about the process, we're, we're trained to sit and read the evidence. The country capitalism is the title of this book came very late. I had no idea what was going to, if anything, mm. was going to unite all these different case studies that I was really interested in. But then it kind of popped off the page that all these companies, as you said, and just to be clear, you know, it starts with Coca-Cola. We go to Delta Airlines, which most people don't know, started in the Mississippi Delta. That's why it's called Delta. It was a crop dusting company, you know, and then moves to uh, Walmart, as you said, and then FedEx and then Bank of America closes out the book. What united them is that all of them were servicing these, these hard to reach areas, these more rural communities, and they saw it as an asset. Like, mm. you know, Bank of America was the largest farm bank in the country, which we don't think of that. We think of it as like, you know, financial center and big cities, yeah. but it's truly the countryside that made these firms what they are. And, you know, you're in a business. Uh, and thinking about Amazon and this, this big empire that we think of the Amazon economy today, that came to me later too. I said, this is in so many ways connected to this economy that we can we can click right now wherever we are and i've lived in some pretty small towns you know 250 people and it shows up in a day you know so how did that world come to be i think some of these companies were way before jeff bezos mm -hmm. and you mentioned walmart i mean jeff bezos went to benville mm -hmm. he flew there he um he read sam walton's biography he hired most of his distribution team out of bentonville much to the chagrin of Walmart that tried to sue him, actually, and said, really? yeah, they were like, you're taking all of our people. And so, but the South doesn't, I mean, I, to me, that's just not how we think of the American South. I don't think we see it as the birth of this Amazon economy. We're all connected to, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of what I thought was interesting is, like you said, you didn't really talk about agriculture a ton. You didn't really talk about slavery a ton, although certainly things that happened during that period led to the next period. And I thought that was super interesting where it's like this change happens. One of the things you said was uh, when people stopped having slaves, they needed to transition their farming system to like machinery and uh, chemicals, mm -hmm. which those chemicals sort of led to like Monsanto chemicals and, uh, you know, crop dusting and things like that. I thought that was so interesting to see that sort of progression and how things changed that led to this sort of new era that that is sort of the era it sounds like you're talking about in the well, book. Well, you, you teed it up so nicely. And by the way, it's always so nice to do podcasts with people that read the books yeah. and actually I get listen into to it. it. Yeah. I, I wanted to read it, but or you, even talk, listen to it. you talk about Amazon. This got delayed, and I was going to take it on my trip, and it didn't arrive. So I was like, uh, sorry, man, I'll, I'll buy two copies now. I got the audiobook and the regular book. So. But that's the beauty of this, too. And a shout out to UNC Press. Presses don't always do that, but, you know, really getting the, the audio contracts so that more people listen to books now, I think, than. All of us are so busy, and it's such a beautiful thing. Um, I still, I've never read my own <laughs> book, and uh, some have given me a little heat for that. They're like, you should read your own book. But Do you think if you read it, you'd read it in your own voice? I well, I guess it's be, in your head, right? I but. think it would be the most, like, hardest thing to do, because you'd want to, like, perfect it, you know? And there's people that are trained in the art of this, you know? So I, I'm totally fine with doing the Coke model, outsource it, let somebody else do it. Well, now, now that I know you and I've heard your voice, if I read it, I'd definitely be reading it in your <laughs> voice. I read, uh, I'm reading Ray Dalio's book. He's a, he's an investor and he's got a really like notable voice and I've watched a lot of his videos and I just like can't shake it from my head. It's just in his voice. The <laughs> yeah. Whole time. No matter whether who's saying it. Yeah. yeah. It's funny the, but you, but you teed up something really important to me, like that I've off the bat that I think was worth mentioning this is not a book that's like, rah, 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 this is all awesome. In fact, it was designed to suggest that when we teach the history of the United States in a, in a sense of saying, you know, this is just an economic backwater of the American South, it's easy. Because then you can say, well, then that's why, you know, Jim Crow was so bad and segregation was so bad and so forth and so on. 
when in fact you read this book and you can see that you know some of the most modern corporations of our time are evolving at this in this space in mm-hmm. this ecosystem at the same time that Jim Crow is tightening and becoming intense and I think that's a message for us you know as citizens to recognize that we have to do the hard work you know push beyond just bringing in the factory of the business we actually have to do the hard work of treating people with the respect they deserve and and, and building those support networks for each other and building community that it just doesn't come necessarily because you have a good business that's booming in your town. And and I think that's an important kind of corrective to the way we teach history. Because it's usually like you read your textbook, it's like, and then in the American South. Now, back to the rest of the story, yeah, you know. Right. That's uh, probably not helpful for all of us. I mm-hmm. think it makes us uh, question how we have to go a little bit further, I think, to, to correct some of the... Uh, wrongs we see in society Mm -hmm. and do you think that that history maybe not telling the whole story is just because slavery they lost the civil war they're the bad bad guys i'm doing air quotes right now like we don't need to tell that story it's just helpful for all of us it's like it's like where where you can take out your trash take it to the american south it's Mm. like this is where all our national sins can go to die easy to blame we're not the south we're good you know instead of saying we're all complicit in this there's all you know this is a this is an economy of which we're embedded and uh for good and for bad and, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about lopping off the American South, you know, and people talk about politics today and things like that. I think seeing the interconnectedness of all this, to me, I think that's, that's kind of a subtext of these stories mm-hmm. is that, uh, that we're all linked to this. It's a kind of global story in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this era, this kind of way the country was led to the development of companies like Coca-Cola. Exactly. The Coca-Cola story I thought was really interesting because when I'm listening to it, I didn't realize that, you know, when you think of like these iconic companies, if you don't know the history, you're thinking this was one person and they had an incredible vision and they just took it from like the Jeff Bezos story, right? Like we all know Jeff, he was just like, you know, a wild man. He had this idea, he took it and start to finish and then boom, it's you know a hundred billion dollar company. To me, that's not how I heard the Coca Cola story. I heard yeah. it as the man who sort of invented it. Well, he didn't even really invent it, right? He kind of <laughs> borrowed it, you know. Exactly. So maybe just talk us through that. Like, how how does this company, which seems to have so many different really influential people, and their model, which I see you call Coca Cola capitalism, like it just seems not like the story I thought I would hear about. Coke. Well, it certainly wasn't the story I was expecting, having studied the history of American business in grad school. The, the traditional story is like U.S. Steel and Rockefeller. Yeah. Rockefeller. It's like vertical integration, own and manage everything, and that kind mm-hmm. of model. Uh, there's a great book called The Visible Hand by Alfred Chandler that'll put you to sleep if you want to go to bed at night. But it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977. And it's taught a lot among um, you know business scholars and things like that. It's taught in business school. And, and I was looking at our economy, and I was like, Where's U.S. Steel right now? You know, like mm-hmm. not 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 to say it's bad, or, but just to say like in terms of profitability and the types of companies that are kicking butt and taking names, it's a very different model. Mm. And so Coke's model, as you said, it grew out of a very different story. I mean, John Pemberton, who started it, he's basically this like this guy that you would not think is about to make the best brand the world's ever known. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you count up the things, so first of all, he's an ex-Confederate soldier from Columbus. Uh, Georgia. I always pause on that when I teach it here, and most students are like, "What?" And I'm like, "There's another Columbus." Yeah, uh, which we all know. But um, but Columbus, Georgia. You know, he gets hurt, injured in the defending the city of Columbus, mm. and he uh, he by all accounts, Coke does not like to talk about this. I apologize if you get any flack from them, but this is just in the record. You know, he gets addicted to morphine. Um, all his friends are worried about him. He's worried about himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and Which that would have been basically available. Yeah, especially to him. And it was available. He was like a ph- pharmacist? He was a pharmacist. Oh, wow. um, so Getting high on your own supply. That's high rule number one, guys. Supply. So yeah. you got to go find your methadone. <laughs> yeah. And his methadone was Coca. That's why Coca-Cola. You know, um, you've got this cocaine that is not perceived in the way it is now. Maybe this will be good. And he comes to Atlanta I mean, I'm thinking about you and your success of your business. I mean, he's not there. You know, he is like just trying to get there. He shows up in Atlanta because it's a bigger city. He his business burns down twice. Mm. He's 
he, he goes bankrupt by the end of the 1870s. I mean, if you're taking stock of this as a business entrepreneur, yeah. you're like, okay, yeah. he's going to fail. Yeah. He's on drugs. He's, he's laid up most of the time because he has stomach aches from all his, he got shot up in the war and everything. And uh, yeah, he has no money. Um, and so what he does, as you said, and this, this really irks Coke because they don't like this part of their history, but he just knocks off a brand that's doing really well. Mm. And um, it's this Bordeaux wine, red wine, mixed with the coca leaf uh, called Vin Mariani. And everybody was drinking it. It would have been a red wine with this little uh, bit of co coca leaf that would have given it small quantities of the alkaloid cocaine. So cocaine wine. I tell the students like four loco of the 19th century. American company or no? Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, in mainly selling out of France. It's a Corsican uh, guy named Vin, uh, Angelo Mariani who's produced it. Very popular in Europe, but our president, Ulysses S. Grant, starts consuming it. He loves it. Who wouldn't? Really? Why wouldn't you? I mean, some, the students ask me, have you ever tried it? And I'm like, I don't, th I mean, no, uh, mainly because of the restrictions on coca leaves today. But, you know, it sounds good. Sounds the fun. Pope drink it. We'd all be Catholic, I think if we had it for communion. Um, you know, he just loved, this drink was amazing. And so he looks at it and says, let's do it. But if you know anything about, and, and this goes back to logistics, like the challenge there is, you know, you've ever heard of Georgia wine country, you know? No, there's mm -hmm. no yeah. like, well, now there is. Right. By the way, you should tour North Georgia. There's some interesting little well, wine. Well, there's stuff. Ohio wine country too. There is Ohio wine country. They yeah. have to use special grapes that have been adapted to handle the cold weather. And exactly. By all accounts, it's not as good as some other places. Maybe some other places. On the other hand, pretty remarkable. It's remarkable. Go off yes. as a business. And yet, back then, no way. So it's very expensive. It's about a dollar a bottle. And he calls it Pemberton's Wine of Coca. He just completely knocks it off. And, uh, it sells 500 bottles a day, he says. Yeah, they're drugs. I mean, yeah, they sell themselves, as some people would say. Wine and alcohol and cocaine? Who, who's going to complain? But the city of Atlanta, as the story goes, um, bans the sale of alcohol. And you can just see this entrepreneur. He's like, dude, I've got it. And then, dang, you know, and this, actually, this is a story for any business person, right? You've got this great idea, and then a law comes in, and you're like, mm -hmm. what do I do? So he reformulates, and he takes out the wine, and he makes it a temperance drink. The carbonated water replaces the wine, and you got Coca-Cola in 1886. And so to your point, this is a person who's really stumbling his way to the best brand. He's not in control necessarily. And have The one thing I would note is, see how global this is? Like, he's pulling the coca leaf from Peru it's already. It's impressive at yeah. that time. At that time, although that's the South, and that, again recognizing that helps us understand this this contradiction of sorts wow you have this kind of backward retrograde social institutions even though they're thinking about science and talking to each other and reading the french journals about you know what's the most popular thing and that's that's the best way to understand this late 19th century american south and he also puts in the cola nut with a k which comes from west africa mainly he believes that the caffeine in that cola nut is better and mm. there's no indication <laughs> chemically that there's any reason to think that. Interesting. Is there anything else in it that maybe... The flavor of the cola nut itself, which remains, uh, as far as we know, a secret ingredient in the drink, merchandise number five. It's the fifth secret ingredient. That's mm. how they call their secret ingredients. They call them merchandise. They would describe them in different ways to hide it in the it's historical very record. drug dealer -esque. Yeah, it's very Esk. drug dealer-esque. Yeah. If they're trying to, you to shed that, drug dealer, you know, yeah. Here, here's more on drug dealing <laughs> for, the, for anyone who's interested. The Coke's term internally for a long time for um, like consumers that were high consumers, which would have included me. Right. I grew up in Atlanta. Yep. We drank it more than water was heavy users. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Like, don't call people Jeez. users. Jeez. Anyways, but, um, but uh, yeah, so you've got this crazy story and... I think the point for maybe this project and maybe for people listening to, to this from a business angle is, and I didn't see this until later, is that what this all meant is that you had a person with very limited capital. He did not have a lot of cash. He didn't have a lot of things on hand to be able to invest. So he had to create a very sleek <coughs> business model to make this all work. And I like to think of him as kind of almost like Microsoft years later. We think about Bill Gates selling and 
you're old enough to know this, but when I talk to my students, they're like, what? Uh, floppy disks, you know? The, the, the smart thing about someone like Gates is that he wasn't necessarily trying to sell the whole big machine. He was trying to sell software, a sleek product that you could go boom, 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 and sell it real fast out in the economy. And that was what Coke did. It was syrup, you know, this concentrated syrup that was sold in jugs, and then it would expand at the point of sale. Right? Mm. You'd sell it to a soda fountain operator, he'd pour a little bit of that syrup, and then mix it with 80% of the finished product, which was mm. water, at the point of sale. What a cool business model. And people saying, this is what I call Coca-Cola capitalism, kind of staying at arm's length from you know, making and, and actually owning much of the infrastructure that's going to make this. He's kind of being this middleman in the process, and it turns out he's doing it not because he's a genius, because it's, he's broke. This is the mm-hmm. best way for him to make money. He can't go drive across the country like Colonel Sanders did, right? Exactly. He's like, I, I just need to get it to someone else to do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this off, and it becomes the motto. Like by the 20s, when Robert Woodruff and a couple other people take over the company, they have this line that says, "Oh, I'll butcher it," but it's something like, um, "You know, you can go very far if you don't care who gets the credit." Hmm. And that becomes kind of like indoctrinated into the Coke religion of it's okay to hand things off. In fact, this is our model. And I started seeing this in the archives. I should note that Emory University had a lot of the executives' um, correspondence, including this Coca trade and all this stuff that they say wasn't in the drink. You can see it very clearly. Yeah. There's no Coca in here. Yes, there was. Mm-hmm. Um, and still is. The Coca leaf as a flavor in the drink. Um, that that was an incredible story that I heard you tell about how they seem to have almost an exclusive right to just to get the coca leaf into the United States. Yeah, a monopsony, uh, as opposed to monopoly power, monopsony with an S, this single buyer access to the ingredient, which gives them a cost kind of benefit here. If you're the only person that can access an ingredient, then you don't have a bunch of buyers coming mm. in competing for price. Right. So they, um, yeah, and they got this through a series of laws that are in our, our narcotics laws here in the United States that basically allows Coke to bring in these coca leaves in the United States, but prevents pretty much everyone else from bringing those coca leaves in. Yeah, I thought it was sort of ironic. Uh, I was reading this, and I th- sort of had this thought that they've moved away from slavery in the south and then they've just kind of like moved to a different country right right uh, where the coca leaves are sort of you know obtained by i assume local farmers and then the cola nut i'm sure those people are not making an enormous wage off of coca-cola um it, it's kind of just an interesting like exportation of the problem out of your viewpoint right yeah and, so. and i think you're absolutely right and i think one of the things i'd say about it is i went to peru talked to people who represent the coquieros who produce this just think about this for a second. You got a company that literally puts it on the name of their brand mm. and has made billions of dollars selling this product and yet won't acknowledge this relationship because of the connection between coca leaves and cocaine. And just to be clear, coca can be, oh yeah, here you go. This there is you go. 1988. Pro- this is 88. Great. Wow. Alex is on point because this is probably the, um, the last time, I can't believe you pulled this up, it's so good. This is the last time that Coca-Cola acknowledged in press that the coca leaf was still in the drink. So for those just listening, this is an article by the New York Times from 1988 about how Coca-Cola obtains its coca. Yeah, so wow. go down. So go, if you can go down, Alex, because you'll see this. Um, let's keep going down. Just oop, Sorry. It actually says this is a digitized version of an online publication from uh, right 96, here. yeah. Right there, right there at the, at the bottom there. In a telephone interview, this is, this is remarkable because it's the last time that Coca-Cola, in print, says ingredients from the coca leaf are used, but there is no cocaine, okay? Because when I, my book came out, it was funny. You'll see, you can hear pi, uh, uh, exchange between me and Coca-Cola where they just basically get tongue-tied. Because we're showing the documents that show this relationship, the coca leaf still being in there. And the person says, uh, Coca, what? I don't know. I don't know the secret formula. I can't speak to it. Oh, he actually ends by saying, I have plausible deniability. And, you know, you got to understand, I was young when that came out. You know, and you think about this as young business people trying to make their name. Like, for me, in our business, integrity of the work and, you know, someone saying it's not true or something like that, 
that's that's a big charge. Yeah. You know, and I was saying, there's the documents. You even had said it in the New York Times. Right. This idea you're denying it is like, it's super weird. By the way, that was after New Coke, which was a huge failure. Right. In which they removed a little bit of the coca leaf during that time. When People Coke apparently kind of hated the flavor. They did. I don't think it's because of the coca leaf being removed. They had sweetened it to try and catch up with Pepsi because mm. Pepsi had just gotten Michael Jackson. And they were <laughs> like starting to lose market share fast. I mean, you think about the 80s. Like, what's the biggest <laughs> symbol of, of, yeah. of stardom that you could get? Michael Jackson and Pepsi got them. Um, but yes, one of the things they did in that 1985 formula by, according to a document found by Mark Pendergrass, a friend of mine, is uh, it says, you know, uh, we removed the coca leaf as well. And it makes sense. The war on drugs, Reagan, we don't want to have anything to do with this coca trade. And, mm -hmm. But as you can see in 88, it's back in. Yeah. Everyone rebelled. They want the real thing. And the coca leaf is part of that. So the original inventor of the formula... He doesn't really own the company that long, correct? He dies. It's so sad. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, you get, finally get this thing off the ground. And again, as somebody who's, who's done that and got, imagine if just everything was just taken away right then, you know, he's finally beginning to see something. So he never gets to see Coke become what it's going to become. And it's left to this guy, Asa Candler. He, Asa buys it? Asa buys it, and it's, a, it's actually a really intense exchange between his son, who has title to this, and a lot of legal back and forth. Oh, really? But Candler's able to kind of outcompete everybody and get sole control of this formula. And it probably was not that big of a company? I mean, it was... No, it, it was, wasn't even incorporated yet. It mm. was incorporated in 19, uh, 19, in 1892. Mm. So after the formula, let's see, 1886, the formula comes out and it's officially incorporated by Candler as the Coca-Cola company. He sees this product as taking them far. And at that time, it, it would have had the coca leaf in it, which would have included small quantities of the alkaloid cocaine. It would have had uh, the cola nut in it, which you know has this distinctive flavor. Uh, lots of caffeine. It's got, I think the original formula called for like five pounds of sugar per gallon of syrup, which is like, think about like a gallon jug of milk. With five so the original sugar. formula would not have sugar in it. No, it would have had sugar. So I it would see. have five pounds of sugar per gallon of syrup. So that's like a gallon. It's just, I always think of like a gallon of milk yeah. filled with five pounds of sugar. That that seems like almost all of it. <laughs> like, yeah. it seems like most of the jug. And you, you got to cut it with something. So phosphoric acid helps to, to, to create a flavor profile that allows your body to take in that sugar and that dopamine release mm. as a result. But then the acidity kind of cuts the, what otherwise would probably be like way too sweet. Yeah. And I know Coke has also maintained that the caffeine is, is not for, uh, the bump it's for a flavor you know flavoring that, and, and that's where the cola nut came in but ultimately of course the caffeine as we yep. cheers yep. have our coffee, our coffee here i thought it was going to come most of their caffeine because you got to think about this again coke doesn't own things so they want to get coke they want to get everything on the cheap you know you got to understand this is sold for five cents all the way up to 1950 that mm. was the, and interestingly they kind of hemmed themselves in because they had all, you know, you can still walk around towns, main streets. I don't know if Marysville has this, but like where you have the you know, five cent plastered on the wall, mm -hmm. you're kind of stuck with yeah, that. Yeah. So they had to figure out how to sell this drink for five cents. And they've got all these things in it. Coca leaves from Peru and cola nuts. In the coca case, they created a monopsony. They mm. cut out all the other buyers. They're the only buyer they buy for cheap. They got this super cheap ingredient because they're the only people internationally buying this stuff. Great system. For caffeine, they become the single largest consumer of caffeine on the planet. Mm -hmm. So where the heck are they getting that caffeine for such cheap? And it turned out that the main source originally was waste tea leaves. They were basically broken or damaged tea leaves on the floor of tea exchanges around the world that nobody wanted. And so here you see this Coca-Cola capitalism at play, like taking the waste of other industries and by the way, not actually owning any plants that decaffeinate things, mm. but finding businesses that would do this work for them. Almost Mons like businesses that needed to grow. So they're like, hey, we'll give you this big contract, but you got to deliver for us on the low. And that little company was a little known company in St. Louis named Monsanto. That it blew my mind because I got access to their archives. And you, they would wait to pay their workers at Monsanto 
until Coke had paid them. That, that's how that's how significant the contract was. They weren't making any money but for Coca Cola, mm. and then they would go on to become this leader. We're sitting in soybean fields and cornfields here, right? The leader in ag and genetically engineering. None of that would have happened but for this relationship with Coke. But notice that Coke, again, is like operating at arm's length at all times. That's what makes them so flexible and resilient throughout these. Why is Coke such a good buy, you know, KO on the stock market for so long? Because they can pivot. Like when, so then decaf coffee takes off in the 1950s. And they're like, okay, that's much cheaper to get the caffeine from the decaf coffee. It's already out. It's already out. They're, they're basically throwing it away again. There's a lot of it. There was no decaf market before that because people were like, why do you drink caffeine, coffee without caffeine? Yeah. <laughs> and so they switch. And, you know, you look in the letters in the archives in, in Atlanta, and Monsanto's pissed. They're like, dude, we've been doing business for like 50 years, and you're just switching to the – and I love this letter from Robert Woodruff who goes salmon fishing in Alaska with the Monsanto exec and all this, and he's like – I'm sorry, man. It's just, you know, it's just business, you know? And, and that's the, you know, you see this again with high fructose corn syrup. It's cheaper. We don't own sugar plantations. Just go. Mm. It's a, I didn't expect to see that when I was writing the cookbook, but it became the very different model from that U.S. deal. Own and operate everything, kind of control all of that. Coke's, it's not that they don't have control, but they're always operating at arm's length. Mm. And in fact, in the 40s, last thing I'll say on this, you can see it in the archives. I remember there's a young person coming in, and Robert Woodruff has been the boss of the company for a long time. This guy's like, we need to buy some orange groves down in Brazil. You know, we need to own all this. And it's like, I could just imagine them. The letter makes it seem like you know, kind of the smack down in the executive office where he's like, little you know, kid from Harvard, whatever you are. No, we don't do that. We want to be insulated from that kind of risk. We want to be nimble enough to be able to pivot. We don't own things is really what he says. It's a smart strategy. Yeah, no, and that, totally to your point, it does sort of upend the conventional wisdom. We want to own this building. You know, I don't want to lease the building. I want to own it. I'm exactly. the business owner. I want to own it. I don't want to lease this equipment. I want to own the equipment. You know, I want my employees to do the work. I don't want contractors to do the work. Um, you actually can see some of that same spillover with Amazon, right? you know, because Amazon makes an enormous amount of their revenue through third-party sellers. Exactly. So they don't have to take the inventory liability. They're making money every step of the way with someone like us, third-party seller, because they're making money uh, when we get the inventory there because they start getting storage fees. When we do the transaction, they get a 15% referral fee on our sale, and then they get a fulfillment fee. So they're getting paid one, two, three, and they have no risk in that. Yeah. If they start to have too much risk, like, hey, you have too much inventory, they start charging us more. Exactly. Or they just start saying, hey, we're going to dispose of this inventory. Like, right. we, don't, we can't have you continue to host this here. And I think with Coke and all these other companies we, we launched into earlier, you know, that are in this book, the kind of Walmarts, et cetera, what unites them is I, I see them, I call them the conduits of capitalism, you know, and the, the channels. And, and it turns out that being the channel is where you can be quite profitable and good. Now, of course, as an environmental person and someone thinking about that, mm. I think there's also a lot of thoughts about, okay, so then what are your obligations, given that this is an incredibly lucrative business? In what ways can these conduits be more sustainable? What are the ways they can think about those things? But from a business angle, I think it upended, in my mind, the kind of Chandler model that we talked about, that Pulitzer Prize winning book from 1977 vertical integration. Let's look at these companies. By the way, he's writing it in 77. I mean, if you look at the Fortune 500, I'm not blaming him. Back then, it's like GM is way up there. Mm -hmm. You know, all these kind of like heavy vertically integrated firms. But when I'm writing this stuff in the early 2000s and 20 teens, I'm looking at very different companies that have both sustained themselves over that long period and become profitable even in the new era and new companies that are recognizing that kind of being in the Logistics is, I don't think, even fair enough. Just kind of being that middle people in that economy, brokers of the economy, conduits, is is a, uh, a very lucrative way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I have gone back and talked to my university a couple of times, and I'll tell kids, like, hey, if you want to make some money, go into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. like, just manufacture something. Because there's an enormous demand out there for people who want something manufactured, but... They'll do the marketing, they'll do the sales, they'll do all of that. All you have to do is make it, 
they ship it. Hey, transaction's done. It's out our doors, you know. Mm -hmm. The only thing we need to do now is either keep you ordering more, which is simple because you're doing the selling, or, hey, if you're not having success, that's fine. We can go find more customers to do the manufacturing for. Yeah. Yeah. And we've exported a lot of that in the United States to different places now because of those cost competitive things. But, you know, depending on what you want, specifically like food items, because we deal a lot in consumables, like people don't want your food like manufactured in China generally. We're okay with ingredients, but not the final product, right? Um, not to mention just the fre freshness thing. You got to get it back to the United States pretty quickly. So <clears throat> food manufacturing, health and wellness supplements, you know, nutritionals, all that stuff. That's a huge market to manufacture. And a lot of the people that I know that have done very, very well are in that manufacturing. Mm -hmm. They're not the brand owner all, uh, always. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you said it early, like if you can go far, if you don't need to take the credit, like a lot of the people that I know that have really successful manufacturing facilities, people don't know their names unless you're in the industry. And those are the guys with like 1,000 acre farms and ranches, you right, know, exactly. not the guys who own the brand. Right. So. Yeah. You know, I think it, if you look back to the history of the New South, a lot of, of what people were saying is come down here and do timber and do all these different things, and that's going to be the face. And mine, you know, we think about Birmingham and, and, and all these industries. What was different about Coke is they kind of saw themselves, as, again, as like these channels of the economy, and they wrote about it that way over time. They kind of saw themselves as like, I mean, if you think about it, like, Coca-Cola, which we think of as the quintessential American product, I think. Like when I go somewhere, it's like Coke, you know, it's it's global, but yeah. it's but almost nothing in it is from the US. And yeah. I got back to your point. It's like it's really remarkable how global it was from the very beginning. I mean, even some of the ingredients we haven't mentioned, like cassia oil from China, that's part of the secret formula, and um, just various, various little in, in tinctures and ingredients. You could argue that actually is quintessentially American. It's like kind of the world in pulling one it place. together, yeah. Yeah, but but it's uh, it's it's very different than I think what a lot of people think, and uh, I think that's why it's captured my attention for a long time, not just because I was from there. So, yeah, and you know, from an environmental standpoint, you sort of talk about this that because this company is sort of like at an arm's reach from all of these different vendors and parts and pieces, maybe it sort of feels like they don't have as much of an obligation and. <clears throat> in other interviews that I heard you give, I heard, I heard one of the hosts say, like, let's separate, like, corporatism and capitalism for a mm -hmm. second. Because, like, mm -hmm. I'm a business owner. I'm a firm believer in capitalism. Um, I think that it's helped me in my life a lot, being a business owner. Everyone that I know get, who gets involved in it and does it the right way, whether it's the right way and the wrong way, right? Um, it's beneficial to them. I think if more people knew more about money and how to make money and how the economy worked, like they'd be in a better position to not struggle. Um, but when the company like Coca-Cola gets so big, it sort of becomes something different. It's not a, co I own a company. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola is not a company anymore. It's a corporation, right? It sort right. of has this like own thing that it, it could operates. could even argue religion. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like internally, that was the thing that struck me so much, how much there was kind of like a, you could even see them with this coca thing, for example. Like they obsessed about, what if we remove this? Well, the people will know. What's funny? Nobody knows it's in there in the first place. Right. And yet, True, this kind right? of mystique of the secret formula, you know, it was Im clearly imbued in the highest up C-suite executives there. So I think you're right. It's a different beast in so many ways. And and you know what's funny now that I'm 41? I was such an idealist when I first started on these journeys, and um, I didn't know how things were gonna kind of pan out when I would write about these firms. Um, but as what was so weird, like when the Monsanto book came out, I was, uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, there's obviously hard hitting documents in these books. Like my job is not to push a brand or to, my job is to go into an archive and tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've tried to do a lot better job of is telling the human story. Because I think one of the things we do is make the, one of the best piece of advice I got as a writer, sorry, best piece of advice I got as a writer was um, a friend of mine who was reading it. He said, I said, Monsanto was doing this. Coke was doing this. He said, Coke's not Monsanto. Who's doing it? Who's inside the company and wh which one? Mm -hmm. And distinguishing between the person making this choice that might be maybe a bad choice and the maybe senior VP who's making the right choice. As a historian, that changed the game for me. So, mm. like, okay, let's get in deeper. Who's actually making the choices and who's the one pulling, making the decisions? 
So when that Monsanto book came out, what was weird is I was, um, I was sitting at my desk here in Ohio, and I just get this email. Um, and I haven't talked about this very much because uh, this was later in this whole journey of that book coming out. And it was from Bayer that owns Monsanto. And I was like, uh, whoa, what do I do? Is, you know, honestly, is this a subpoena? Is this like, are they unhappy? And I opened it and it said, look, um, congratulations, I've read this book. It's, it's hard to read, obviously, some of these parts, but um, if you'd be up for it, I'd like to have a conversation and I get this is weird. I think it's what he said, but like, if you'd be down for it, I'd really like to talk. Mm. And I remember at the time, you know, having written a lot about businesses and watching certain actors be a little bit nefarious about greenwashing and things like that. I was yeah. like, what's the intentions here? I pulled in my team of people. We were talking about very close friends and trips that you do with fo- close friends. And I have the same thing. Um, people that are around me that I really trust, and you clearly do too. I think it's also, by the way, a business tip. Like, pick people to put around you that you really... And I think it's as a writer, it's become critical because I can mm-hmm. play ideas off. What do we do here? What's, what's the strategy? And people that I've known since sixth grade, you know. And the answer was you believe Bard in giving people the full range of human emotions they deserve. And so let's give this person a, a chance to talk to you and, and let's do it. And I'm happy we did. We, we, they ended up coming here to Ohio State, the senior vice president they of the company. They came to visit you. They came actually as a demand, a kind of a, not a demand, but like I said, look, if we're going to have a conversation and it's going to be on the record, I want you to be here. We also have a documentary film company and would you be willing to be on film and let us control that? And when he said, yeah, wow. we'll be, I thought, okay. And, and it was funny. We were standing outside of my house in just a few miles from here. And they showed up. We had the film crew there. And I could tell that he was taking a risk, mm. that he was making the decision to say, like, let's put ourselves out there. Let's listen to our critics. Let's see what we can do. And then what we, was his role? He was the, he's the number two, basically, in the company. Wow. Senior vice president answering cr- directly to the CEO. I mean, number two, these are all hard definitions, but basically has the ear of the CEO. And um, it was a weird moment. We walked in the house, and we made, a, we made a joke about, like, now I know where you live. I remember being like, oh, gosh, this is weird. Uh, <laughs> but you, know, you think about Monsanto and its history. Oh, yeah. Right? And everything Orange. you said, right. you know, obviously. So anyway, but we showed up, with, and I said, look, I want you in front of the students. And it was an amazing moment, you know, for about an hour and a half with film crew there, we, with, you know, on the record. Students just got to go and say, look, here, okay, I understand you care about this, but here's something that I really think you need to fix, you know, and here's, here's an issue. And, and, I, and we're still in conversation, and I think it's a productive one. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. And maybe at some point I'll feel like, you know, it's not having the effect mm-hmm. that it's going to have. But what I've realized is like businesses that are open to their critics, even just through this experience, like what an opportunity, you know. I'm not out to get people when I write things. I am out to try and get it right. In fact, when this, these books come out, the, my hands will be kind of nervous because I'm, all I'm worried about is, did I get these folks right? In this book, you know, it's the CEO and chairman of Bank of America. I got to go and sit and listen to him talk. And I wanted to make sure, no matter how I put it, not to ch- change things just to make them look good, but that I got accurately what they were trying to say. And so back to your point, I think one of the things I'm trying to learn is that all these businesses are made up of humans. What I'm learning is that businesses that are let lean into their critics have an opportunity. And instead of seeing this as kind of like, oh, you know, we're going to try and make this person, uh, you know, challenge them and discredit them. Um, if you invite them in, there might be some really productive things that can come of this. I mean, one of the things that's happening with Monsanto is the suggestion that they might want to think about getting involved with Agent Orange cleanup in Vietnam. Mm. Now, they're not sure they're 100% there, but, like, this is a conversation that might not have happened had we not been in the room. And, you know, my dad was in Vietnam. What an opportunity, like, for real positive change. I think that's where I'm at at 41. It's like, I will meet you wherever you are. I will talk to you. There's a, there's a rule, you know, I'll talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Let's see if we can actually get something done, mm-hmm. you know? There's a lot of negativity out there right now. Yeah. And this is a world that should be about how can we take what you do well and what I'm doing and, uh, and, and try and make a difference. Yeah, I mean, that's just a lesson in communication, honestly. I talked to some of my 
like younger, more junior managers here. And when they need to talk to someone about something difficult, I see them a lot of times get emotional, like right away. Like, Mm -hmm. Bart, I can't believe you did that. And it's like, you got to understand when you approach someone like that, they shut down. Now they're defending themselves or they're like, screw this guy. I'm not going to listen to this guy, which I'm sure would be the same result if you went and talked to him and you're like, well, you've done this. You've killed these many people. And he's just been like, okay, well, we're not having a conversation anymore, so I'm not going to help you. Thanks. Interview over. Right. But if you're willing to be like, hey, I, I understand where you're coming from. I accept some of my own responsibility in this thing. Let's talk about it. Let's work towards something more positive. You know, I think that's a really fundamental thing in terms of communication that a lot of people just don't get. And when I see people go into a conversation so emotional, I'm like, you don't understand. This is not having the effect that you want. You know, you talk about like uh, <clears throat> sports. I refereed soccer for a long time. And I, this was a weird, like, eureka moment for me. But when people started yelling at me as the referee, I like turned off from them. I'm like, this person's a dick, you know, (laughs) like I'm not going to help this person on the field. And it's not even like a conscious thing where you decide like, I dislike this person. I'm not going to give them the calls that they want, but you, you have to sort of have like a a thing go off in your head. Like, I don't like this person. Yeah. And it's hard to be neutral because then you're fighting against your own instinct. Like, I don't like this person. Exactly. So when that started happening to me, I was like, oh, man, I was probably not that nice to referees throughout my like time, you know, playing soccer. And the things that I said probably were not that helpful for me. Right. And it's the same thing, I think, when you talk to people. And it sounds like you, you got that figured out because you have to have these hard conversations. Well, this is a better book in that sense. You know, if you look at my earlier stuff, it's like th- th- there's a lot of Coke did this or that. And this is more about talking to people. You know, the chief sustainability officer at Coca-Cola who was uh, left the firm and, uh, you know, talked to me for this book. And I think provided insights that I never would have gotten otherwise. And part of that is, again, being more humble. And also, in the very beginning of this book, I say this. I say, I'm, I'm as complicit in the story as anybody else. You know, I'm clicking on Amazon, and I, I'm a part of this economy. And that humility, I think, has come um, over time, you know, for me. As, and as I've gotten older, I kind of realized I'm not that smart, too. Like, I'm, I got... I, I, Whatever anyone thinks about social media, one of the things I've, I'm not a huge tweeter. If anyone's curious, I don't know why. Uh, I looked through Twitter. And it was, yeah, it didn't I, grab a lot of exactly. It's a lot stuff. of it's a lot of just kind of retweeting other people's stuff, and mainly it's because like I really don't think I have a brilliant idea that often, like to just share every second. And so, um, but but what I mean by that is like I think we live in a time where there's this kind of I'm right you're wrong, Definitely. you know, and so there, we're going to go at this. And I'm seeing companies in this experience that are getting it, I think, on ESG uh, mm-hmm. and environmental issues and sustainability being like, okay, let's be a little bit more <laughs> humble about this. Let's see if we can have some conversations. There are also companies that I think I've read about that are not doing that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, you know, it's, it's, it, and I, maybe it's because of just, you know, PR control, et cetera, legal departments, you know, getting nervous, but I'd, I'd like to think if we're going to solve some of these really pesky sustainability issues, cause I get it. Like I'm looking at Delta airlines in this and I'm, I'm sympathetic in a way. I'm like, what is the freaking solution right yeah, now? To there's this? no way to make clean burning jet fuel. Right. And I'm going down to Atlanta, you know, on these planes. I like, I get it. I, you know, I almost started that chapter. My mother passed away um, a couple years ago and, you know, to get to Atlanta, you're going to fly on Delta. And, uh, and, you know, I'd grown up with this brand. And so, you know, it was kind of a poignant moment just being on that plane because I was writing about Delta, but they were providing like a real service to me in that moment, you know, when you're probably at the worst moment of your life, kind of feeling you lose somebody so, so close to you. And I think that's what's changed me as a, as a writer is, and that's what we're trying to design here at Ohio State is to bring businesses in. Mm. We'd love to have y'all and, and to talk about this and say, look, Let's close the doors. Maybe not have the documentary film companies there. What's your problem? Mm-hmm. How can we help you think through this? But let, let's be open to it. Let's go hard at this. Creating kind of labs for corporations to come in and say, if you're serious about trying to do good in the planet, we're here to help you think it through. And we get that you've got pesky problems. So let's work on it. Books are fun to write. I think at this stage in my life, though, it's like, how do we move the dial? You know, How do we really change these big systems. 
and, uh, and make them better. I think there's some answers in this book. I think for things like aviation, phew, pesky problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but things like Coca-Cola and maybe th- rethinking some of their some of their strategies with refrigeration could be interesting. M- may unlock huge opportunities for greenhouse gas emissions. That was really interesting. The refrigerant, how big of a problem that is. But such a yeah, it was their the refrigeration. I didn't expect to see it. It was the low hanging fruit from my last book was that it's the largest contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions. Just refrigeration, simplest thing. We want a cold Coke. Dang. Yeah, you said they were not interested in the idea of warm Coke or room temperature Coke. Yeah, I mean, they did. What was weird in that early section was like reading these newspaper articles where they were trying to sell hot Coke in the winter. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, the, and people were like, thank you, but no thank you, you know? Yeah. But, but it kind of makes sense. It's like, who wants a cold Coke in the winter? Mm-hmm. And then they had to learn how to market that. But what an actually pretty remarkable advertising achievement to teach somebody you could have a cold Coke in the winter, which they did. Um, but yeah, little things like that. But also talking to the engineers in the company. That's the difference with this project for me. It's like, dang, what a challenge. Yeah, I see your problem, you know? And in fact, in this book, you read that, you hear um, Jeff Seabright. He said Greenpeace was coming at them really hard on this and saying, look, and the issue here was this. Coke had switched to um, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. Uh, as their chief refrigerant. If anyone's listening to this, go check your AC unit. It's probably running on HFCs. They emerged in the 1990s as a replacement for CFCs, Mm. chlorofluorocarbons. The problem with those were they were causing a hole in the ozone layer. Mm. And so they were banned. And the company said, ah, we got the next best thing. Without chlorine, we'll call them hydrofluorocarbons. This is great. But it turns out that those HFCs are about a thousand times more potent as a greenhouse gas mm. than carbon dioxide. So that you've switched from a ozone depleting substance to a massive uh, uh, global warming uh, issue. Well, <laughs> Coke looks at this and says, "We've switched. Now what do we do?" You know, and you could just see this 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 conundrum of what are we gonna? How are we gonna fix this? And Greenpeace comes out in the early 2000s and puts a lot of pressure on them. What was so interesting when you get to talk to people inside the firm was to learn how important that was. Jeff Seabright said, if it weren't for them pushing us, we wouldn't have come to the table. But you see this story in the book where Jeff decides to lean in. He says, look, he goes to Greenpeace. He has them sign an NDA and says, I want you to sign this before I'm about to do what I'm going to do because I want you to see what I'm dealing with. And he says, once they signed it, he showed them the books and was like, here's what we're dealing with. Mm. And he says, once they could see where we were at and that we're trying to deal with the issue, they were, you know, it was like, okay, well, let's work together, see if we can figure this out. And they come up with a cool solution. They basically started switching to carbon dioxide as the chief refrigerant in their uh, machines, which is interesting because we think of CO2 as like the chief greenhouse gas, but it's a thousand times less than Mm. HFCs. And they have made a huge change there. They have switched to these much more um, low efficient uh, refrigerants, and yet it's still a big issue for them. And so thinking about, do you need certain of your products to be cold all the time in every market? It's an interesting idea. Coke wasn't very keen on it, (laughs) as you might imagine, because we live in a period where it is about this immediate consumption. And historically, this is very anomalous. Yeah. Just like, have it now. Yeah. But um, so it's a pesky problem and I get it. But being able to see that from the inside was really interesting how they worked through that. I also think that it's just so obvious now to see these problems sometimes because of these companies and the scale at which they are operating. I kind of had this moment where I saw that where Amazon was getting into a lot of trouble because they were disposing of inventory. I mentioned they'll just dispose of your inventory sometimes if it's sitting in their warehouse for too long or it doesn't sell or if you have a consumable product and it expires in their warehouse. Like, what are they going to do with it? Well, it's not a very good solution to send ship it back to you so that what, I can ship it to a landfill, right? So what they were doing is they were disposing of this inventory for sellers. Mm. Um the problem was that somehow someone got like a video of this and it's just truckloads, like full truckloads of just like stuff, just mm. like everything you could possibly imagine that they're disposing of, right? 
and people were understandably upset. They're like, this is an environmental nightmare. You're throwing away like perfectly good toasters and cups and all this stuff. And I was like, well, yeah, that definitely is a bummer. But what you're seeing is 5,000 little mom and pop shops that have closed down and then they reside now in that warehouse. So mom and pop shops threw stuff away. It's not like they didn't throw things right. away. It's not like they didn't dispose of expired inventory. That was still happening. It's just now concentrated in one place. And, and maybe you could even make the case that it's like slightly more efficient, that it's all in one place now. Mm. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. And it's just very visible when you see like a 53-foot a truck yeah. just full of, for lack of a better opinion, is shit. It, you just are like, wow, that is terrible. How could they do that? It's like, well... Well, all these companies became so visible, and I think yeah. that's part of the story too. They became the targets of this in part because they're just you just you think about this as a historian. It's like something like Amazon, my gosh, you know, or Bank of America, you know, with this with all these bank mergers that I write about. You know, yeah. when interstate banking <clears throat> is is allowed after 1995, and then the repeal of Glass Steagall, we have these mergers. It's just incredible. Here you go. We we got a video destroying millions of items. Uh, of unsold stock. Wow. Yeah. Well, so what they also do and have done um, is sometimes they'll take your inventory. Do you mind just like skipping forward and muting it? Uh, oh, this is an investigative journalist. He's inside of Amazon, the belly of the beast here. Destroy. Yep. Wow. So the, what, what we're seeing for those just listening is... Uh, this gentleman, he's got a video. He looks like he's inside of Amazon. This is in a UK warehouse too, which I should mention that the UK is like one one hundredth the size of the Amazon market. So right. this is probably nothing compared to like the US. Right. It's certainly not a good thing. But again, it's just the scale of things is that all of these mom and pop shops now have been consolidated inside of Amazon and, you know, uh, everything is together. Yeah, he's he's showing you perfectly good, at least looks like they are perfectly good, calendars and books and uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, power surge protectors and yeah, 86,000 items he's got on his screen. I've never seen this. Yeah, 124,000 items are set to be destroyed. This is showing it just like a computer and 27,000 donate. So we donate a lot of our food um, mm -hmm. to the food pantry. Um of which, you know, it's expired, but generally pretty safe, I think. And the food mm -hmm. pantry seems to have no issue getting rid of it. Sometimes they'll even ask us, hey, do you have any more of that chocolate? The people that come really like that chocolate. Right. Um, but, it's like, you know, it's like with anything. you got all this size, like, that comes great responsibility. How do you deal with it? How do you redirect it? How can we take all this and make it, as you said, more efficient in terms of, you know, making sure you don't waste all this? I, I was kind of curious, if you don't mind yeah. talking about it, how much do you interact with, like, FedEx and these – express delivery folks or UPS or whoever. So um, FedEx ended their relationship with Amazon maybe three years ago, right. something like that. Mm -hmm. So now UPS is generally the exclusive carrier for Amazon. I mm -hmm. think the story that was that Amazon was just beating them down, beating them down, beating them down, and FedEx went, hey, we're not making any money off of this deal. Like, right. we can just go deliver our own packages. We don't need to deliver Amazon packages. Right. So we interact with UPS a ton. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so every single day, UPS comes to our facility twice. They'll pick up somewhere around 12, 30, 1 o'clock with a, a semi-truck. And then they'll come again, usually with a box truck for anything that we've created between like 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock, somewhere in that radius. Wow. Yeah. Uh, UPS uh, is our primary shipper to Amazon, USPS. Uh, Postal Service is our primary shipper, like directly to customers. Mm. We do far fewer shippers directly to customers than we do to Amazon. So mm -hmm. basically all that UPS stuff is going to Amazon. It's going to sit in their warehouse. Then Amazon's going to distribute it to, you know, wherever they think will be close to the customer. And then they're going to manage that final fulfillment and logistics. Um, yeah. But a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think about that, it's like FedEx back somewhat to the South story. UPS had been around by the time FedEx emerges in the 1970s. Oh, by the way, speaking of how you get inside these companies, just a little tip to people, um, and maybe this is like gonna ruin my technique for businesses out there who are gonna get on this, but like um, one of the best ways to get inside a company is just to play with uh, company email schemes. So like, it's not that hard actually. Like at walmart.com, you already got that covered, yep. you know? And then it's like, all right, well, is it, in the case of FedEx, is it like, Fred Smith at FedEx.com. He's the founder of the yeah. company. And uh, yeah, I ended up 
kind of playing with it and sending all these emails that bounced until I finally just like one went through. Like in a couple of days later, I get this like email back from the founder of FedEx. He's wow. like, yeah, I'll talk to you. Amazing. And again, I think just because my strategy was not like, you know, the kind of like gotcha. You know, we always joke like the Michael Moore kind of um, just going to come in, as you said, with kind of vitriol from the business. Yep. It's like, hey, I want to hear about what you're doing. I like legit want to hear your perspective on this kind of thing. They opened up. But, you know, what was so surprising about that was UPS was obviously huge. They'd started out in Seattle and had become such a great um, business on in ground. But in terms of like Air Express delivery overnight, especially to smaller markets, you just, they didn't have the capacity. And that's where Fred Smith was thinking about an opportunity. If you, I don't know if we can pull up Memphis on the Google Maps. Um, on the Google Maps, mm. on the interwebs. Um, He's got the Ohio State just fixing his head. <laughs> exactly. He has gosh. to say the before everything. Oh, man, that's ruined us, the, that branding. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, and we can pan out from Memphis here. First of all, obviously, you see the Mississippi that made this whole story. Oh, possible. wow. Yeah, I guess I did not realize that the Mississippi oh, runs directly yeah. through Memphis. That was the story. This was like conduit of capitalism in its day, you know, back in the late 19th century because you had this huge, you know, uh, river going through. But if you even pan out even more, we go further out here and just keep going, just keep going. You know, Fred Smith thought about this very hard. The environmental story here is really interesting from a logistics angle. Like, he was trying to figure out a place that could that could hit the small packaging market, mm. right? You had UPS out in the big cities, and at that time in the '70s, you had planes, air airlines that were delivering to the big cities, but you had an issue there because most planes are flying during the day. You have some red eyes, but you don't have a ton. Mm. So your capacity and businesses want to do that. They want to like get their business, whatever the thing is, during the day, and then ship it out and then have it be delivered the next yep. day. And so he's thinking, well, not only do, are you not hitting any of these mid you know, the Midwest or the American South markets, but um, you know, you've, you've got this issue of not doing it at night. So he develops that incredible system of having this kind of hub and spoke. He's building on the Atlanta model mm -hmm. that Delta's built. Delta was struggling because they're this airline coming into Atlanta, but they're they're in this, you know, all these small towns in the South. The only way to make that happen was to have that hub and spoke created in 1955 to bring people into Atlanta and then out to mm -hmm. the big cities. Fred Smith in the 70s says, great model. Let's do that for the small packaging market. But he was looking for where you were going to do it. And you might think, like, well, not do like Chicago or some of these bigger cities. But the problem with that is if you go north, it's snow. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be you know, limit their ability to get in and out on, in cold weather. Interesting. And then they, but if you know any, if you've, as I did, spent most of my childhood down in the Gulf, you know, storms and hurricanes and all that stuff, yeah. you can't be down there. So it's perfectly located environmentally. And they, they wrote about this. Like wow. it was an ecological point. And it was, I don't know how many people know this. I mean, probably people that are in your world are aware of this, but it was truly hub and spoke. Like, you're sending a package from Washington to Charlotte and, you, you know, overnight. Well, the way that it would work, it would go from D.C. to Memphis, get there by 11 o'clock p.m., maybe 12. They would sort it in the hub there in Memphis, and then it would go out to Charlotte. And, um, but it, none of it really would have worked in his mind had there not been the ecological kind of perfect spot of Memphis. So once again, you think of the South as kind of like, eh, I don't know, what's going on you know, in these places? Turns out it was like the place where they developed that. And you work with UPS now. UPS got freaked out because they were like, holy cow. They had bought all these Dassault Falcons and little planes to get to these little markets. And they had to play catch up. They, mm. they kind of bat it. It's another example of like um, kind of creative destruction or whatever it is. You know, Schumpeter talking about all this. They had, to, they had to adapt to FedEx's model. So even though UPS was, had been around a lot longer, it was truly the South that kind of pushed them into this. You need to be able to get to these smaller markets. You're going to have to invest in this you know, fly-by-night, overnight kind of delivery, not necessarily just to the big cities using the airlines, um, but also kind of doing this yourself with uh, these, smaller, these smaller planes. It's amazing. I want to take a quick break, um, but i got a, a lot still to talk about. Um, kind of want to talk about Monsanto. I want to talk about Roundup a little bit um, and maybe some lessons that can be applied from some of these businesses. And lastly, like what is there things that small business owners can do or people just can generally do to, to try to make an impact because there's the Coca-Colas of the world, but 
you and I aren't running that. So uh, <laughs> what can we do, you know, on the local level? I love it. Sure. Thanks again. Yeah, Bart. So <sighs> there's a lot of issues out there um, when it comes to like environmental issues, some of which are clearly more significant, some of which are a little bit less significant. I dealt with this at the business level, just like you talked about, like what are the substitution we can actually make? Um, maybe talk to us about what are some things that we could potentially do on a local level that are going to make an impact. Yeah. We, not necessarily just you and I, but, but everyone. I think a couple of things, you know, from all, writing about all these different companies come to mind. Um, one thing that's uh, packaging is obviously a big deal. Yeah. I think, you know, we got to figure out how we're going, going to, uh, move away from all this plastic because we now yeah. know it's kind of just it's just a, a a real real issue coke of course has been labeled by s some studies to be one of the larger plastic polluters and so i really looked into that pretty closely and yet again as i get older and i talk to people inside the industry it's just like dang Mm -hmm. Which you don't realize, for example, these like kind of um, films, which are some of the biggest issues, is that they're designed not just to be like a plastic covering for that salsa that you buy, mm -hmm. but that they have properties that are designed to be anti, you know, bacterial. They're designed uh, to do yeah. all these different things. It's not just freshness in its purest sense of like sealing it, but like has all these other things that like mean that that food can last longer. So mm -hmm. you want those things. I think one of the things that I would say to folks, specifically in Ohio, is that there's a group of us that are working on a very big project right now to redesign and create an entirely new alternative packaging ecosystem. Mm. And um, we are finalists for a very big grant. We may not get it. I don't know. I won't go into too many details about it because we're kind of at the tail end of it. But we're really excited about it because it's we're sitting down with folks in industry. They're pulling in historians, if you can believe that. I mean, the team is kind of out of control, but it's beautiful in the sense that it's kind of looking at it from every different perspective. What are some of the things we can do as a chemical engineer to redesign these things? And some of the stuff they're developing is just amazing. I mean, you know, um, I was talking with a, a, a colleague who's using coffee grounds mm. and eggshells as a filler for a new type of plastic that would be produced in part through microorganisms poop essentially mm. and you're talking it was funny i was sitting there waiting i was like okay what's the unsustainable thing here and i was like yeah that all sounds pretty good yeah um and so we've got this team in place and i think these research institutions like ours that are there and saying hey you're a business you're interested in trying to to rethink your packaging, we're here to help. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, reach out to these institutions that are doing this because there's a lot of really exciting work that's going on that's being funded right now by the NSF and other things to try and think this through because I think it's one of the biggest problems we've got to solve. Um, and I think one of the things I would say from from the Coke story, whether you're a big business or a small business, is looking back to the history of businesses like Coke, the returnable systems that were in place back in the early mm -hmm. you know, 20th century. It was incredible. I used to look at these Coke bottles. I would research them. They would do 50, 60, 70 trips back and forth between consumer and, and uh, supplier, in part because they had these deposits on them that were about, uh, for a five cent drink, sometimes two cents. Mm -hmm. It was like a 40% markup on the product, which I get from a business angle is challenging. Like, but on the saving side of it, you were seeing reclamation rates of 96, 97% of mm. these bottles coming back, back and forth between consumer. I, th the lesson I learned from that is that if you don't put a price on packaging, it's going to be treated like trash. Mm. And that's what ends up happening. Yeah. So how do you do that in a business efficient way? It's one of the things we're working on yeah. in the policy team is like, how do these deposit systems work? They work really well. Like you can reclaim this stuff pretty, pretty, pretty well. How can we design it in a way that, you know, um, works for, for big and small businesses? But I see that returnable system, even if we do develop these new plastic films and things like that, which I think we're on the verge of, of potentially doing, I think returnable is kind of the best way to go. Um, 
And in the logistics space, one of the things that was really startling was looking at these new, not even really new now, but the, I don't know if y'all use these things, the little trackers, little remote sensing devices that allow you to do, track all these things. Currently, a lot of those things and a lot of markets are, um, you know, they never make it back. Mm. It's, it's a lost cost. Um, and it's also a big pollution issue because those little things can have all sorts of um, compounds in them that you don't want in landfills. And these would be places. inserted in the package or like in like mm-hmm. a pallet? Because we have these in pallets. In pallets. Um, sometimes in packaging. Uh, FedEx has a, a uh, the, open this book, the SenseAware ID, which kind of blew my mind when I was talking to them about this. But, you know, these little kind of Bluetooth size, little small, almost like key fob sized little tags that they put on their really sensitive devices. Mm. And I think one of the challenges is how do you create a system to ensure that those things <laughs> don't end up in the landfill, that they keep coming yeah. back. Um, returnable seems to be the best answer moving forward. One of the most provocative things I'll, I'll suggest, kind of going more philosophical, is that people read a book called Cradle to Cradle by Bill McDonough. Bill McDonough was a, um, thanks Steve, pulling this up, um, was a... Remaking the way we make things. Uh-huh, he was a... Oh, he's got an institute also. Yeah, and that's probably the institute, and there's Bill McDonough's kind of webpage down there. He was the um, dean of architecture at the University of Virginia, where I did my, my degree, and... This book is about how do you cre- how do you design things mm. to have true like cyclical circular economy yeah. designed to them, and among the more provocative things, and I get it, people listening to this would be like, "Whoa, this is way too out there," but but he's really provocative. He says, you know, think about your business as a service. If your carrier, for example, the air conditioning company. Mm-hmm. Right now, the model for care to show its shareholders that it's generating value, it says, I, we have to sell more uh, carrier units than we did last year. Yep. You know, it's kind of a material, like, here's the, the, uh, the AC unit that's going to go into your business. More inputs, more Exactly. Materials, he said, what if labor. you could sit down with your team at Carrier and say, you're in the business of selling coolness. Okay? Now, step back from the materiality that you think is the way you have to sell that service and start thinking more abstractly about, okay, all you got to do is figure out how you get these buildings cool. Mm. And if you and, and he walks through, of course, geothermal and some other options there. I mean, now some businesses are saying, dang, my business, that's a lot harder to think through. But I think it's a, a tremendous exercise to yeah. go through. Like, you could say for all sorts of things, like Uber's in the business of getting people to where they go. Okay, yeah, yeah. let's step back from that and think, okay, now it's we think it has to be these cars. But we're actually just, all we need to do is provide this service or this quality or whatever it is. Can we reimagine this? In the case of Coke, it's a pretty big challenge. Mm -hmm. If you really step back and you say, well, what does Coke say they sell? It's open happiness. And Mm -hmm. it's like, okay. Mm, Now we're getting into some like pretty like, uh, you know, hippy dippy kind of thinking. You have a Buddhist monk with a Coca Cola t shirt on (laughs) teaching a class in a park somewhere. And the the stockholder's like, thank you very much, but we're not going to pull over our money. We think we'll stick with sugar and caffeine. But I think think people will find more practical solutions in in Bill McDonald's work, uh, Cradle to Cradle. It tries to walk through, like, for example, why designing the car has been so problematic because you have like, a plastic dashboard on top mm. of a you know this other type of plastic that cannot be separated or reused you think almost kind of what he's calling for it's kind of interchangeable parts you could argue like 19th century mm. thinking of like being able to p- truly pull these things apart and be able to use them again we're seeing with robotics like remarkable things in that space i don't have you seen these crazy things um steve i'm not sure you'll be able to find them but it's like the I'd love to see it because I don't even know if I've seen them on YouTube, but it's like Apple now has these incredible devices that will just like in a matter of seconds just dis- disassemble mm. your iPhone, and, but be able to do so in such precision that all the little different components are segregated so that they can be re- reused again. <laughs> this may be, um, yeah, impossible to search for, but... Um, Apple introduces Daisy, a yes, new robot yes. that disassembles. It's still in a 40 second, 46 second video, so 
Apple's disassembly robot Daisy can take apart up to 200 iPhone devices, I think it said an hour, covering high quality materials that other recyclers can't. Oh, it's like part of it's disassembly. Part of it was just breaking it apart. That's hilarious. Um, it's kind of remarkable. Apple will donate to Conservation International through April 30th. Yeah, I mean, this is a crazy one, you know, like these electronic devices. Um, because you've got so many. So this is like the Bill McDonough like nightmare because you've got like yeah. all of these different things layered on top of yep. each other and trying wow. to figure out how, how you can reuse them. But honestly, this gives me some some kind of hope. I mean, every now and then when I see a technocratic fix, you know, you're like, uh oh, where's, yeah. the, where's the problem here? They're but still... these disassembly robots are like fascinating in terms of their ability to take materials and segregate them so they can be reused again. Yeah, I think that one of the big issues is always just the cost. And I know people will make that claim, and, and maybe you can comment on this, that, well, you know, it's a little cost for it saves our planet. And it's like, okay, well, that's easy to say for you when you're not the business owner who's like, hey, I have 30 employees who they want raises, you know, yeah. like, Lindsay, want ra Lindsay wants a raise because she's a single mother, and right now she has to take off two hours at the end of the day that she's not paid to go pick up her son because he has special needs. Yeah. It's like, okay, make the case to me that now, like, th this, like, it's not obscure, but it's like an abstract thing that Alex is going to save the planet, right? By doing what? By switching bubble mailers that the United Postal Service gives us for free to, like, this thing that I buy that's made out of cardboard. It's like... <sighs> I'd love to say, like, I can do that. I will do that. I'm the guy to fix the problem. But, you know, it's hard for us to justify spending 75 cents more on every single item that we sell times 1.3 million items a year. Yeah. And it's I think like, hey, we go out of business. Well, you saved the planet. Well, no, because I now 30 people are laid off, right. you know? So it's a weird place to pivot to when you say that. But Walmart strikes me as an interesting conversation there because if you look at Walmart, you know, they committed to sustainability is a broad term. And, you know, what does it mean? But they committed to trying to be more eco-conscious in terms of their business in 2000, around 2004, 2005. It was a dramatic shift for the largest corporation in the world. Prior to that, you know, they had done some piecemeal things. They tried to build, you know, more eco-friendly stores, you know, and but then found actually that, back to your point, some of those things were really costly. Yeah, so hard. So they, so really hard. And so they were struggling. This was, um, this is worth showing, by the way. They had just come out of like some really bad um, situations. And maybe Steve, we can find this. It's, it's Mother Jones has this clip. And um, you can put in um, Walmart, children, something like that. Um, and this is, you'll get to see the CEO. By the way, whenever I show things, I like to hear people in their own voice because some people will say like, you're, you're, you're kind of- um, No, you're butchering. You're what, butchering what? What, what really happened here. No, that's not working necessarily. Let's see if we can do, um, you and I might define children differently, if you can put that in quotes. So you and I might define children differently. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> I'm, I'm pointing this out because this was like a real, disaster for walmart in the 90s and they would ultimately yeah let's see if this yeah and one thing while uh steve's looking for that that i'll say um yeah that's when, perfect when it comes to go ahead first first clip sorry uh is your favorite baseball team's owner i don't know why oh. it's still, <laughs> is your favorite baseball team's owner still an asshole um it's a nice clickbait i'm not sure who the owner of the cleveland indians are the guardians i should say exactly and if you maybe search down you'll keep going down you'll see walmart and you'll see a clip about walmart and child labor but for whatever reason you have to go buy the red Sox and everything else oh here we go here we go do you want um sound sure yeah. hit us yeah and and um just for the sake of time i think if you go into the Maybe middle oh, of this So I'll summarize what happens at the beginning. We'll just pause real quick here, and we can go to the middle. What, what, what Walmart had decided to do in 1992 was buy American. Mm. And this goes back to some things we've been talking about, like you know branding, and, but also these tough decisions about cost and so forth. And what Dateline, or I forget, I think it was Dateline did, they came in and they said, they looked at the shelves, and they were like, you know, things made in Bangladesh and other places. And they said, look, this isn't made in, in, in the US. 
And then they went to the factories where these things were produced and mm. what they see is child labor, which is what you'll see here. They then get the CEO to sit down. I'm, I show this in part for any CEOs thinking about like strategy and PR control. This is like how not oh, to handle no. the situation because David Glass, when confronted with these images, basically says, you and I might define children differently, oh. which is not the response you want to have. Mm. But I think this is like somewhere in the middle here. Um, he's confronted with these images, and you'll see this this clip. Um, And the point here is to say, Walmart's shown this, and it becomes like a crisis. Yeah. Because David Glass is going to respond completely in a wild way, and probably in the time that we have, it may be difficult to get to where we see the CEO say what he says. But uh, yeah, if you keep going a little bit forward, keep going a little bit forward, keep going, keep going. There he is. He's kind of confronted with these images. Saying children's are locked in the plant. So he just said, horrible things happen all over the world. Oh, and then the reporter goes, is that all you want to say? And then you see the handler come in here, and he's like, well, this interview's over. Then what's interesting is that he gets to, David Glass, who runs, this is the CEO of Walmart, gets to go home and kind of rethink what he just said. And then the oh. next thing you'll see in that is he goes, okay, and we're back. And he's like, Okay, so anything else to add? And he basically says, I think you and I might just define children That's differently. That's what he came up with right? when he was sitting at home that night, like, well, what do I say to this? I, it's just such a wild clip. And people can go check this out. It's, it's on Mother Jones. But um, Yeah, and I mean, this is clearly still happening. You know, maybe not necessarily with Walmart. I mean, but... This is not something that doesn't happen all over the place. Right. And he sees this thing and he responds this way. And so the company's kind of in crisis. They're getting attacked from all different things, but mainly from labor and from uh, labor rights groups and things like that. And in 2004, they're kind of sitting there. The CEO, does not, H. Lee Scott, by that point, he's replaced David Glass. You can imagine yeah, Glass well. is kind of out. <laughs> Um, is not really an environmentalist. He doesn't. He, does, he, he says this very openly. He's like, not. That's not his like thing. He's interested in this business and so forth. But he, a guy named Jib Ellison from this consulting firm called Blue Sky comes in and is like, it's amazing. He started this rafting company out in the Pacific Northwest. And what he'd do is takes company officials on these crazy like death-defying raft trips. And get them to come together. And, and basically, after they survive these class five rapids, he's like, all right, now I think we're ready to talk. And it's true. Like, they were all, like, shaking. And it's like, Whoa. okay, like, we're vulnerable. Like, let's figure out our business. And he, Jib is able to convince Walmart, and this goes back to your point, that, you know what? Um, you can make a lot of money if you do these small things mm. here. One of the biggest things he talks about is taking a box that holds a teddy bear and he's like, you don't need the box. You don't need the stupid box. Mm -hmm. You know. In fact, if you look at the savings that you could have with this bear being in this shipping container, you can save you know, millions and millions of dollars. And H. Lee Scott committed Walmart at that moment to going, as he put it, just like radical change to going green. Mm -hmm. They saw it as an advantage to them and a, a way to be more efficient, to make more money. Um, and I think there's thousands of examples like that yep. where you can say look this isn't necessarily just about saving the planet it's about like reducing this inefficiency in your system yeah here, here we have it right on the screen uh you and i might perhaps define children differently uh, i mean i mean if you look at the pictures in the video i they don't they're not teenagers you could you know what a teenager looks like you know what someone who's like an adolescent looks like and these are I mean, they're not like four, but they're not 15. I and mean, here's what's clear. crazy. I mean, Walmart literally said they created what's called the thesis index. Most people don't know about this, where they were going to track the environmental footprint of all the different products that were in their 
building. Can you it's imagine? It's an undertaking, to say the least. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're in this business with the logistics and so many things moving through the system. It's like... Well, not to mention you get a product, you lose a product. You get a product, you lose a product. Exactly. And so the idea was to literally have like this, this scoring system where you're going to be able to see everything and be able to do this kind of management. Now, that never fully materialized, partially because of how difficult it was to do it. But what an ambitious undertaking. And Walmart was kind of at the forefront of it. Yeah, and you know, one thing that I haven't heard you talk about, and maybe you do, um, I know you talk about the health impact of all the sugar from Coca-Cola, but the plastic that's in those bottles is not good for your body. Um, yeah. And this is something that I picked up. Um, Dr. Shauna Swan, she wrote a book about it called Countdown. She's been on really big podcasts talking about it. Um, the plastics are accumulating in our bodies, yeah. and they specifically will accumulate um, quicker when you do one of two things. One, when you drink uh, liquids because the plastic can leach into the liquid much more easily. Um, it's a little bit harder for the plastic to leach into the pineapple that you got because it's solid, you know, um, or, you know, the steak that you bought that's, you know, covered in cellophane. A little bit more difficult. It still probably happens at some capacity. Um, but, you know, that Coca-Cola you're drinking, it might have been bottled in 2001. Mm -hmm. you know, or 2021, sorry. Yeah. Uh, or 2000. Be pretty flat in 2000. Yeah, it probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 20, yeah, exactly. It's been there for a while. It's been there for a while and it probably has light that's kind of hit it and kind of, you know, worked on that plastic or maybe it's been in a hot truck somewhere and that heat kind of melts into that plastic, you know, a little bit and makes that uh, kind of sink into those liquids. And the second thing is just, uh, you know, microwaving or heating anything that's plastic. So mm -hmm. I like tell everyone like when they are in here and they're cooking their food in like a little plastic Tupperware container in the microwave, I'm like, no, you cannot do this. This is terrible for you. Yeah. And I think people will generally rea react in their own self-interest, right? And that's kind of the tricky part is helping people either A, see that it's in their self-interest or B, when we come to like a financial thing, it's like, hey, the plastic thing is so much more expensive or so much cheaper than the glass bottle. You know, yeah. I buy cranberry juice and it's in a glass bottle. It's like $10. The ocean spray is like three. I'm like, ah, gosh, you know, yeah. now that has like added sugar and stuff that I don't want, but it is tough sometimes to make that financial case, but I know there's an enormous health case to be made with the plastic that we all kind of have around our food supply. Yeah. It's one I think about all the time. You were talking about kids earlier and I think about it because, you know, I, as I said, I'm in, is embedded in this. And by the way, even when you're drinking it in a can, you've got a plastic lining, mm -hmm. you know, and when chemicals inside of it are preserving the, exactly. the can. If you go back liquids. to the original canning, you know, in the forties and thirties, Coke was slow because of the acidity of the drink. Mm. It would eat through the linings of cans, and you'd see, you know, people having these metallic-tasting drinks. Um, and they ultimately were able to perfect a lining that would contain the acidity of the drink. But then you've got acidity alongside a lining. Originally, it was called like it was a vinyl-based product, which is, you know, we can only imagine <laughs> that probably is not good. Um, I even do taste tests in my class because students say, I can tell the difference you were just in Mexico, mm -hmm. the difference between a Mexican Coke and a, a Coke in the U.S. because of sugar cane, real sugar cane. Oh, yeah. In Mexico. What's, what's, a start, what's amazing, and I've done this with thousands of students at this point, um, is that hundreds of students is that they can't tell the difference. If you take a glass bottle of high fructose corn syrup, coca-cola in the united states and compare it to mexican coke in a glass bottle they can't tell it's mm. like it's indistinguishable the high fructose corn syrup and the sucrose sugar cane sugar it's too hard for our palates to actually distinguish that mm. they think it's because of the sugar but in fact it's it's because of the uh, we don't generally drink in glass yeah and so when they try the plastic they tell the difference it's a it's a big distinct difference i you know i think with this plastic thing it's um I talk about it. We're trying to work on it. And mm -hmm. for anyone who's interested in talking to us, we're at Ohio State. There's a team of us that can't even fit in a building, basically, with trying to really rethink how do we do this? Precisely because this is not a problem that's out there. As you put it, it's in our bodies. We do not know, frankly, right now, what the long-term health effects are of all this plastic in our body. And it's so new. If you think mm -hmm. about it, Coke switched to plastic bottles around 1978. And that's in historical times. Yeah, that's like nothing. Yeah. So the people who might have been drinking it, you know, when it shifted, are just getting to an age now where they might 
start seeing some detrimental health effects. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it's not obviously not just plastic bottles, but everything else that yeah. we're exposed to. Last thing I'll say on that is Coke did a, the first life cycle analysis study to try and determine whether they should switch to plastic or not. And I got a hold of that study that they did s- secretly in 1969 mm. that was trying to say, should we switch to cans, bottles? What's the best environmentally friendly package? That study was very clear. It said a 10-trip returnable glass bottle is the best way to go. 10 trips. So all it had to do, and by the way, most bottles do more than that if, you, if you're if you actually paying attention to it and reusing it over and over. Mm. Um, but they actually told the public in 1974 or so that we've done our research and we've decided the plastic bottle is the best way to go. Mm. And that's because of what you said. They saw tremendous energy savings. Just astounding compared to glass because of the weight yeah. and the fact that it doesn't break. Yeah. And at the time they thought we can recycle this. That was the key. If you can recycle all that plastic and it doesn't end up in our body and everything else, yeah. it's great. What we now know are documents from the chemical industry and plastic industry that's that are really damning. But that they knew it was not recyclable, that they knew it would be disposed and be waste wasted and yet did not kind of alert the public to it. Yeah, I wrote down a stat that I think uh, you had. Um, I saw you cited a 2017 on that and said that something like only 30% of plastic is actually recycled. Yeah, 30% of PET plastic bottles. PET. If we're looking at all plastic, it's a, it's just a minuscule percentage. Um, oh, the same piece of plastic can only be recycled two to three times before its quality decreases where it can no longer be used. Interesting. And that's National Geographic, and that's right. I mean, the the issue is that most of these things, even when they say, you know, it's going to be reused again, it can only be reused once because it starts breaking down. Mm. So it's just a, it's a, uh, but here's, here's like the human story. As you said, like, it's so easy to indict, but think of the magic of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's the, what was, uh, gosh, you know, it's trying to think of the, the graduate plastics, you know, it's the future. Yeah. <laughs> It, who couldn't believe in it? Yeah, I mean, and it's almost impossible. You look around even just like any room you're in. I mean, the camera, it's all plastic. The TV, a lot of plastic. You know, headphones, Your you clothes, know, clothing, probably. which I know that one's really bad for you, too. You use these but synthetic take clothes. Okay, I'm trying to be hippy-dippy here with my cotton orga- shirt. organic yeah. oh. cotton shirt. Ohio State's paying them good money to buy <laughs> organic, yeah. And then I think about, well, damn, look at that scale. Of even if it's organic, just the, you know, the amount of land, mm-hmm. water you have to have to have cotton. These things are super challenging. Yeah. And so, you know, again, the idealist would be buying these shirts years ago, be like, I got it solved. And then you're like, wait a minute. You know, we had Patagonia in to my class, uh, Vincent Stanley, who was the, uh, who was there at the beginning with Yvonne Chouinard mm-hmm. in Patagonia. These are real, real believers. They really do oh, want yeah. to try and design their products the right way, and and yet there's, you know, their products were coming in plastic packaging to us, and some of the students were just like, "What gives?" You know what I really liked about the response to Vince's? It was just no greenwashing. It was just like, "It's bad. Shouldn't do it. We're trying to figure out a around, way around it." You yeah. know, it was a very practical business response, um, but. You know, they're really radical in their thinking. But even then, you know, the, the, the kind of down Patagonia jackets that everyone, you know, raves about, even though a lot of those fibers are recyclable, those microfibers are, that's part of the plastic story, going into the laundry and then ending up in the system. So even companies like Patagonia that are thinking really hard and trying to do this right, it's like, yikes. Um, there's, you know, we really have to fundamentally rethink what's going to replace this, this thing that when it came out, everyone's like, holy cow, this is mm-hmm. going to change everything. And by the way, if you go back to the historical record, they said this. They saw plastic as the environmental thing. Yeah, You were not going to have to have cotton fields everywhere and go back to Jim Crow and all the things you just talked about and the exploitation of all of that, of the agricultural labor. Um, but uh, turns out these solutions are not as easy as, as even myself as a younger scholar once thought. Just go organic. Here's the answer. Yeah. But I know you're optimistic. I am. Today, especially, I think, you know, as students come into the classroom, um, you know, I'm taking students for the first time to the UN Climate Summit this year. It's the first 
delegation of Ohio State students. Cool. Got, this is really fun um, to, to see them light up. We just met them, just told them they got some money too to go. <laughs> Dubai is not exactly the cheapest place. This is where that's where it is. Exactly. I was thinking New York. I'd say, hey, that's still a great trip, you <laughs> yeah. know. But dang, Dubai. All right. Yeah, a weird place to talk about climate. But if you need okay. me to chaperone or anything, you should let me know. Please come along. Um, and and I do, I do have a lot of hope. <laughs> I, you know, it was funny. I got a chance to interview Jane Fonda weirdly when okay. she came to Ohio State, <laughs> and and the students had kind of picked a professor to talk with this with the guest speaker and they said, would you talk to Jay? I said, sure. And I remember thinking it's going to be like softball. She loves climate change and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I was like, um, and I, at some point I just said something like, yeah, you know, it gives me hope is this next generation is going to fix a lot of our problems. They get it. They understand it. She just jumped on me. She was like, don't put this hurt on them. You're a big boy. You're part of the solution. And it was a really eye-opening moment. I think at, for me especially, because I was starting to be like, okay, I'm 41. I'm not solving all these problems. Let's let the next generation. She said, there are adults here right now, and you're one of them, you know, that have a responsibility to try and be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. It changed my perspective on when I say that now. Like, I am inspired by them, but I also get that I need to be there with them, like mm -hmm. trying to figure this out. And that includes talking to CEOs. Like, you know, before it might have been, you know, more critical writing in which I wasn't getting their voice, but like, let's put everyone in the table, you know? Cause I think, I, I also think that this is going to be smart business in the future, you know, returnable systems, circular economy, mm -hmm. all this stuff is going to be, um, it's going to be, it's going to be great. Um, and I think that, uh, that we can, we can fix some of these things, but I don't think we're going to do it in a society right now that likes to be kind of holier than now. Like, I've got all the answers. I'm not going to go inside unless yeah. these folks. Yeah. We have to have these kind of conversations. Um, and frankly, also see what history can teach us. It should be part of the conversation. So I'm hopeful. I don't put it all on the kids. We need to step up, mm -hmm. be innovative. And we're trying to do that at Ohio State, especially when it comes to packaging. Um, so if you're out there listening, come give us a shout. Well, Bart, man, I really appreciate you coming in. This was super fun. Um, you know, you, I love all the stuff that you've done. I love talking to you, and uh, I wish you nothing but success in the future. Any more uh, books you got in the works for us? <laughs> it's funny. Everyone says, what's next? And um, I'm in recovery. You know, after writing <laughs> You're a recovering so author. <laughs> recovering author. And uh, I, do, I do have something in mind, but, uh, but I'm, I'm not, not talking about it yet. <laughs> all right, man. Well, I really appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yep. It's a pleasure.